If there ever was a subject we Christians need to properly understand, it is prayer. Christians who work but never intercede do not so much walk along with God as limp along with God. These next three sessions are an in-depth study on intercession which I shared with a few of my co-workers at Christ for All Nations in Frankfurt, Germany. I pray that these messages will be a blessing to you, but most of all, that you will take the journey yourself and personally experience the power channel of intercession. I can, I can view it. <laughs> The first question that needs to be addressed is, why should we pray? Before we can grasp the work of intercession, we need to understand prayer. First of all, without prayer, there is no Christian life. Can you imagine Christians not praying? That would be a definition of a non-Christian. They do not pray. A clear sign of Saul of Tarsus' conversion to Christianity was that he prayed, as the Lord said to Ananias, Behold, he is praying, in Acts chapter 9. Christians do not spend time on their knees only when they have time on their hands. Prayer is referred to 230 times in the New Testament, sometimes in quite long passages, which are often prayers in themselves. In the Old Testament, there are 85 recorded prayers as well as 60 psalms, which are whole prayers, and another 14, which include prayers. Praying is the big business in the heavenly kingdom of God. Christians are those who call on the name of the Lord. That is our life stance, the heart of the Christian life. If we are to reach God and greet him, prayer is the way to do it. When our spirit soars to God, it is on the wings of prayer. Prayer swings open the door into the dwelling of God himself. Like the Bible, which is substantially a book of prayer, a church is basically a house of prayer, according to Matthew 21, 13. Only human beings can pray. We are unique in this respect. Angels worship. But we never hear of angels praying. And prayer elevates us far beyond the animal level. Animals are not people, and prayer is not in their nature. A dog sees its master kneeling in prayer, but has no idea what is going on. People look up to God, but animals look up only to people. Atheists and uncivilized people can know God, but other creatures are at the farther side of an impassable gulf and do not even know that spiritual things exist. Prayer is also the wonder gift of the grace of God and our highest natural capacity. No person ever born can rise higher than on their knees before God. Men of genius like Beethoven, Shakespeare, Michelangelo and Newton produced immortal work, and all of them prayed. Prayer was their most outstanding performance, coming from their spirit, not merely from their brain. Isaiah 29 verse 14 puts it like this, Behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent man shall be hidden. This standpoint is reinforced in Jeremiah <clears throat> chapter 9, verses 23 to 24, where we read, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. We can all move on that plateau, whether we are people of great intelligence or the simplest of mortals, the humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This is what 
Isaiah chapter 29 tells us. Prayer is not just words. It's our spirit making life contact with God's spirit. Life flows constantly from God like light from the sun. In prayer, we expose ourselves to its rays and sunbathe, so to say, sunbathe in the warmth of divine love. We absorb His goodness. It penetrates to the core of our existence. It is life from above. By prayer, we accept God's invitation to live with Him. There is a lot to know and learn about prayer. Jesus showed us how to begin. He said, when you pray, say, our Father. Luke 11, 2. Before we can really pray, we must have that basic relationship, that son-father relationship. We come to God as his children. If we are his children, then we must not forget to pray. If the son or daughter never spoke to their father, it would be a sign of, of something dreadfully wrong. If we never speak to God, we are guilty of ignoring him. Imagine a little domestic scene. When Jimmy's father comes home, the boy runs to him calling out, Daddy! His father has some fun teasing the child. Now, let me think, do I know you? His son replies, Daddy, it's me, Jimmy. The father laughs and says, Oh, yes, of course it is. You are the little boy I love, aren't you? That is how God feels about us. We are the children he loves. And that is how we can feel about God. In prayer, it is as if we say, It's me, Father. We are born of God, not merely one of his descendants from a long line of ancestors. Our salvation does not depend upon apostolic succession. We are not related to him through the apostles or through the church, but each of us belongs to God's family through direct birth by the Spirit of God. Today we are brought near to God in exactly the same way as the first disciples long ago. A born again person's position in Christ is as near to God as John leaning on the breast of Jesus. Divine fatherhood is the real fatherhood and earthly fathers are only a picture of our Father in heaven. Now, if the basis of prayer is the fatherhood of God, we must be sure that we are his children. Only his children have rights, while others pray as aliens and strangers. But aliens and strangers can become sons of God, of course. The moment we say yes to Jesus Christ and bow to his rights over us, then, as we read, he gives us the right to be the children of God in John 1, 12. The moment we receive him, he receives us into his family. Then the instinct to pray is planted in us. We want to talk to God as he has become our father. And naturally, we want to express our love for him as children for their father. It would be very unnatural not to pray. Romans 5 verse 5 says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. The scripture tells us, you received the spirit of sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father, in Romans 8 verse 15. This is evidence of God's work in us. Many pray only half hopefully, wondering if God, being all wise, will listen to them. They perceive him only as the almighty and awesome and distant being, unknowable and infinite, 
too great even to notice this little planet and the inhabitants crawling around here like ants. But their perspective is wrong. Any father, no matter how great he is, has time for his son. No son ever shrinks back in awe as if his father were too great to notice him. A father loves his son, and his son loves his father, whoever he is. The whole world may stand in awe and fear of a man, but his own son will be happy and free in his company. God is certainly great beyond our understanding, but he is that same wonderful being who has made us his children. We take pleasure in him as he does in us, and he delights to hear our voice in prayer. In Romans 8.15, in Galatians 4, 6, we read that we cry, Abba, Father. Let me look at this special word, Abba. It is a word in Aramaic, the mother tongue of Jesus. It means Father, but in an endearing, loving sense. In those days, it was the word used within the family. Young uh, children and older ones, too, called their father, Abba. However, we have no English word which is its exact equivalent. That is why the translators left it as it was, just speaking of Abba. Some have said it means Daddy, but that is not quite correct. Adults used Abba, whereas adults today rarely, if ever, call their father Daddy. Adults in the time of Jesus' life on earth, did not use children's language when talking to their father any more than adults would today, but they could say Abba without sounding childish. It is not what we call a diminutive, but a term of endearment in the family, a special and loving name. Jesus called his father Abba once in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he was not calling out Daddy. The word father is used 415 times in the New Testament, half of them by Jesus for his father. Jesus did not teach us to pray Abba, but we were to say our father. We are sons, not infants. That is brought out in Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7. As long as the heir is a child, he is subject to guardians and trustees. But since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Okay. Note also that according to scripture, we cry, Abba, Father. The word cry does not mean wail, but a loud cry. The Greek word is kraso. Prayer is not just silent meditation or waiting upon God. It is something spoken, something Said. Prayer is not about having religious feelings and about addressing God in meaningful and positive words. Throughout the Bible we find the phrase to cry to the Lord. The people who wrote the Psalms of David often approach God crying to him to hear. Hear me, O Lord. Hear the voice of my supplication, for instance, as in Psalm 27. Verse 7, crying to God does not mean that he is deaf. It means that we bring him petitions, share words with him about his word, express our feelings and our hopes, telling God about the things that matter to us as we would a trusted friend. Just having religious feelings is not Bible religion at all. Our God walks with us through all the diverse paths we tread. We have been brought near by the blood of Christ, as Ephesians 2.13 says. Family feeling, especially of children towards their parents, has a quality we do not have with friends. Blood ties hold people together even when differences arise. The saying, blood is thicker than water has a lot of truth. 
Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Why? Because we have a blood relationship. But not one that is based on our own blood. It is formed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The nearness that is mentioned here is not a matter of yards or miles. It is the nearness of the family bond. God is our father, not our grandfather. We are not related to God secondhand through some other relationship. People in ancient Israel knew God only through the intermediary of a priest. But the promise was that we should each know him personally. For instance, as Hebrews 8 says, we are as close to God as any tie can make us. When we pray, we pray on the same basis and with the same rights as Paul, John, James, and Peter. We rank equal with the greatest saints. The promises to them are the promises to us. They prayed the same Lord's Prayer as we pray. We have the same privileges as they had. God has no favorites except that we are all his favorites. Praise God. They have the same key to the door as we have, which is the name of Jesus. We come to the front door and walk in without knocking, without a receptionist to announce us. We do not need angels or saints to usher us into the presence of God. We are sons and heirs. We have complete freedom of access into our Father's house. That is a very, very good reason indeed for praying. Hallelujah. We pray because it was made possible at great cost to one person. I'm talking about a very holy subject now. And that is Jesus Christ. We have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It overwhelms me. What a price so that we can pray. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need Hebrews 4 verse 16 that is the whole idea therefore having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. The cost of it is the guarantee we will be heard. How could God ignore prayers that carry such a price tag and the appeal of Calvary itself? It is as if our feeble cry passes through the transformer of the cross bearing the voltage force of the blood of Christ. Among all creatures in heaven and on earth, we are those ransomed from the grave of sin. For God not to hear such prayer is unthinkable. Another reason for prayer is that Jesus prayed. The Gospels record 20 occasions when he prayed. In John's Gospel, the normal words for prayer are not used, but only the words for speaking. There we read that Jesus simply lifted up his eyes and said, as in John 11 or John 17, prayer for Jesus was not a special activity, but normal speaking to his Father. Yet. Even that is really astonishing when we remember who he was. He was the Word, the Son of God. He never grew out of communion with his Father. He and the Father were one. The answer is in the question. He prayed because he was so close to God, not to become closer to him. He loved his Father and loved to enjoy an hour with him. That is how we feel about people we love, don't we? 
Do we need any other reason for spending time with them except that we love them? Jesus drew aside from the turbulence of life to relax and enjoy that intimacy, the sweet hour of prayer. The disciples saw him praying and said, Lord, teach us to pray in Luke 11, 1. Peter says that Christ left us an example that we might walk in his steps. That example included this habit of prayer. In Genesis 5.21, we read that after Enoch had become the father of Methuselah, he walked with God and had other sons and daughters. In his case, it was not until he was surrounded by family obligations that he walked with God. We should make sure that nothing in our home life interferes with our walk with God. Peter suggests that our domestic lives must not interfere with prayer. He talks about arrangements and relationships at home in 1 Peter 3 and encourages them to be orderly so that nothing will hinder your prayers. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Satan tries to hinder prayer because prayer hinders Satan. Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray. He took it for granted that we would pray. He taught his disciples how to pray and had so much to say about prayer in his very important Sermon on the Mount. That sermon was really about the kingdom of God, what people in the kingdom are like and what they do. Every kingdom or nation produces something, generally through, through industry or agriculture. Banks and other financial organizations talk about their products, although they do not actually manufacture anything at all. The people in the kingdom of God pray. Our product, so to speak, is prayer. The real basis of prayer is love for God, not religious duty. We may go to God asking him to meet our needs, but without love, prayer is a heartless business, like going to our local authorities to present our demands. If we love God, we can ask him for what we want without fear, but otherwise, we are like the prodigal son who demanded, Father, give me my share of my estate in Luke chapter 15. That is the story of many a life. Give me, give me, give me, just give me. Life just becomes a constant demand for my rights, however wrong they are. Is God a sugar daddy just there to gratify our whims and fancies? Coming to God only for what we can get out of him is cupboard love. That is a love for the gifts and not the giver. In prayer, we make our petitions known and indeed we are encouraged to do so as we find in, in Philippians 4 verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. But the relationship goes far deeper than that. Prayer is not just a technique we use to get things from God. A book was once uh, published uh, with the title, How to Get Things from God. That sounds rather cynical to me. If you change the last word of the title to father, meaning an earthly father, how would it sound if you said to somebody in your family, I'll tell you how to get things out of dad, as if words could manipulate God. There is no smart card to open the doors of God's goodness. We come to a living God who loves us and who will always outdo us in his giving anyway. Techniques in prayer are like trying to find ways to get round him, to trick him, to go along with what he wants. The Bible has only one technique, which is simply faith. 
working through love, according to Galatians 5, verse 6. We are living in times when children show less and less respect for their parents. Some talk of their father as the old man and wink as they boast about their ways of, of getting the old man to cough up cash. But a Christian approaching God does so with a humble yet intense appreciation of his mercy and greatness. Our rights would not even exist if he had not died an agonizing death on Calvary. As Philippians 4 verse 6 shows us, we are to present our requests with thanksgiving. That is the only technique in Scripture. We pray because the Holy Spirit prays. There is a remarkable statement in Romans chapter 8 verse 26 to 27. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. The Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. First, note the astounding revelation that the Holy Spirit prays. Then even more amazing, the Holy Spirit needs human beings so he can pray. He not only prays for us, but through us. Anyone who prays becomes useful to the Holy Spirit, being an instrument in a heavenly miracle. The unutterable groanings of the Holy Spirit are expressed through those who pray. That is what the Spirit does not say people can say as led by the Spirit. People want to be used by the Holy Spirit and this is a sure way. He is looking for those who will empathize with his groanings. One way to be useless to the Holy Spirit is not to pray. Now a question. If God is all-powerful and knows all things, what difference does prayer make? Is God likely to do anything because we finite and simple creatures ask Him? This question is asked in different ways. Some of the most learned and logical people say prayer is of no value because it cannot change God's mind. And all we can do is go along with His will and purpose anyway. That is half right. But let me explain the basis for prayer, for this is an important revelation which is so rarely understood. Number one, we do not change God's mind when we pray. And prayer must always accord with His purposes. For God's will to be done is what we should pray for. God made the world that way. Heaven and earth exist by his will, and he put men and women here to do his will and work in his creation, complementing his creative activity. The world today is not what God made it, but what God and man made, even though, unfortunately, man often makes a mess of it. Number two. God has power over things, and by prayer, we share that power. God gives us the privilege of causing things to happen which cannot happen in any other way. We have power in prayer to do things for the kingdom of God that we could never do through our natural powers. Number three, God created the world with the intention that prayer would be necessary for its well-being. That is the principle that operates in prayer. He has always revealed himself as a God who bestows upon his creatures the privilege of working with him. Even Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. In Matthew eleven twenty-nine, he did not take our yoke, the yoke of rebellion, but we take his yoke, the yoke of his divine will. He shares with us his sovereignty and the disposition of his activities. 
to govern the world, he relied upon people cooperating with him and praying. Prayer was arranged from the moment of creation to be part of his ongoing scheme. He planned to do nothing without prayers and us. That is the way the world Amen. is. And now number four. A special truth comes from Psalm 72 verse 15. Prayer will be made for him, that is for God, continually, it says there. This does not mean that we pray for God as we pray for somebody else, because God is not in need. It means our prayers are done for him. By prayer we act for God. It is our work and service. It is the product of the word of God. And now number five. God never gave us all the liberty to do whatever we like and ignore his will. It is his world, not ours. People carry on as if there was no divine owner to whom we must give account as stewards. That is a dangerous practice. But we must pray so that God can do whatever he wants to do in this world or with this world. He taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unless we pray, his will is not done. We are co-workers with God and that is why we pray. He gave us the opportunity of sharing his pleasure. If not, we are rebels. Number six. If God's perfect plans are to operate, then we must cooperate with them, and part of that plan is, of course, prayer. That is the divine system. His will and ours are functioning in harmony. The world cannot be what it should be unless we accept the divine arrangement and do some real praying. Nothing that we do without prayer is any good in the end. The managers need to talk to the owner. When the word became flesh, Jesus prayed. Day by day, Jesus opened his ear to the Father. He said, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do in John 5, verse 19. That was his great objective, to bring this world back into harmony with the will of God. In his own earthly career, the Lord was a perfect example of freedom, but freedom to bring about the divine and eternal purposes. Part of the prayer he left us is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is done in heaven. It is not God who does his will, but every creature, every great spirit, every spiritual lord and prince of glory, every angelic power, they know their work and what God wants. They excel in wisdom, therefore they are not puppets, but work in their wise ways towards the divinely ordained end. We human beings must do his will just as the inhabitants of glory do. We work spiritually and, of course, physically. Adam and Eve were set not only to look after the Garden of Eden, but also to walk with him with the perspective of a wonderful spiritual future. It is our legacy also, a career which includes faith and prayer. The world is dark, but when we pray, the laser beam of God's light just leaps through the black night. The only condition is that we ask according to his will. That is, we ask God to do what he wants to do. That is the position which he himself adopted. Some churches set a whole day of prayer apart, but without any special objective. They find requests to occupy the hours. The result is that Little is done because little is asked for. You do not have because you do not ask. 
says that down to earth book of James in chapter 4, verse 12. If you pray with much faith, but for little, you get little. In scripture, special times of prayer and fasting, as well as great answers to prayer, were always inspired by great needs. A church may have a general burden from the Holy Spirit, though the Word of God is our usual guide to prayer. The major call is the Great Commission, and our first concern should be for the world to turn to God. Your kingdom come. You will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Christ's own prayer was similar, that the world may know that you have sent me. That was the focus of the New Testament church. Church members should pray one for another, which could mean praying for quite a varied collection of needs. But usually, personal matters should be shared personally, not in prayer rallies. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, says Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Regular church prayer meetings cannot ignore serious sicknesses and the anxieties of individuals, but should not allow these to crowd out the needs of a lost world. Prayer is the means by which God's will can be done for the world. Often, however, our vision is local, just the people around us blocking out the perspective of world salvation. Even if prayer has no burning objective, it is a spiritual way of spending time. One thing have I desired of the Lord, this will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 27 verse 4. It is fellowship with the Lord, one of our spiritual luxuries. John says, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God wants that we have fellowship with him. The New Testament mentions many subjects for prayer. There are 230 references to prayer, although th these are not a list of 230 things to pray for, they are an important guide on that subject. To simplify matters, I shall classify the references into three main groups, which I will head prayer, intercession, and supplication. Prayer for evangelism, intercession for other people, and supplications for ourselves. First, prayer for evangelism in the New Testament is very thorough and extensive. Perhaps you wonder whether today's prayer meetings have the same wonderful and powerful impact. May the Holy Spirit bring us into line with the Word of God. Here is the list as complete as I can make it. Five of the seven requests in the Lord's Prayer concentrate on the Kingdom of God. Then comes prayer that God will send forth laborers into his harvest, followed by prayer to give thanks, prayer to cast out stubborn demons, for boldness to preach the word of God, for God to stretch forth his hand to heal, uh, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of Jesus, to appoint people to a given task, for people to receive the Holy Spirit. Prayer is also made for persecuted people, to ask God what to do, to give public thanks, to have a prosperous journey by the will of God in order to preach the gospel, for saints to be delivered from those who do not believe, and for God's servant to be accepted by those to whom he ministers, to go by the will of God and with joy that people will be refreshed by the ministry that God may be glorified by Christ Jesus for boldness, for the proclamation of the gospel, for a door of utterance for the gospel, and 
for it to be made manifest and spoken as it should be. Reading further, there is prayer for the word of the Lord to have free cause and be glorified, that those who bring the word may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for hearts to be directed to patient waiting for Christ, for them to have peace and the Lord with them, for those in authority that believers may have peace and a good conscience, for wisdom, for the healing of afflictions, for anyone sinning not to sin unto death, and for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. This lengthy list of prayers related to evangelism reveals the importance with which the New Testament regards evangelism. And now I want to speak about intercession. The second form of prayer is to pray for others, especially believers. We call this intercession. The apostles prayed for their converts with express requests, not just, Lord, bless them. They specified particular needs, thinking about what their needs were and showing concern for their followers. Have we the same sort of personal concern? Sometimes Paul said that, he mentions people in prayer, like for instance in Romans 1.9 or Ephesians 1.16 or 1 Thessalonians 1.2, Philemon 1.4. Prayers are made for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be given to them, for Christians with differences to find agreement, for the preservation of believers, body, soul and spirit, for eyes to be opened to see the greatness of God's power, for people to be rooted and grounded in love and to know the love of Christ, for them to be filled with the fullness of God. The desire is expressed for believers to grow in love, judgment and excellence, to be sincere and without offense, filled with the fruits of righteousness and the knowledge of God's will, to walk worthily, to be fruitful in every good work, strengthened with all might, to combine patience with long-suffering and joyfulness, to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, to abound in love towards all men, for their hearts to be established in holiness before God, to fulfill the pleasure of God's goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of Jesus may be glorified in them and they in him. Then follows supplications. Now we can look at the list of personal supplications, seeking God for our own needs. Our prayers are so often of the give me kind, but it is not always wrong to pray like that. Here are those that are mentioned. The list is much shorter than the list of petitions for world redemption. We are encouraged to pray to be saved, to ask, seek, knock for the Holy Spirit, to interpret unknown tongues, to be saved from temptation, for grace to help us in time of need, for our persecutors, for our enemies, for God to forgive those who ill-treat us, to escape God's judgment on the world, for God to glorify his name in us, like Christ's prayer in John chapter 17, that our joy may be full, that we may know the power of his resurrection to make us conformable to Christ's death, that wrong thoughts should be forgiven. Some things often prayed for today are not included in the New Testament. If a request is not mentioned in Scripture, it does not mean that we should not pray for it. However, we can compare the general emphasis of Scripture with our emphasis. It is a notable fact that though Jesus spoke much about prayer, he said little about what we should pray for. He said, whatever you ask. Prayer is not a legalistic matter. We can open our heart wide and pour out all our desires to him. If we look at the requests we greatly emphasize today, we are perhaps surprised to find that they are not mentioned at all in the New Testament. 
For example, there is no prayer for power. No prayer for God to rent the heavens and come down and enter the field. No prayer for guidance or to know God's will or for an outpouring of the Spirit. God had already done all these things. He did these things according to his sovereign purpose. Prayer is not a casual business. The apostles were men of prayer. So have been other great Christians. Augustine's famous book, Confession, is one great prayer. Paul could say, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God. Romans 15, verse 30. The expression strive together comes from the Greek root word agon. It means a conscious application of one's power to achieve a goal and is used in Paul's exhortation in uh, Timothy. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith or as it is put in the translation called the message. Run hard and fast in the faith effort is implied and something of a struggle is expected. The derived Greek word agonia, which gives us the word agony, re uh, refers to pain caused by a struggle. If you like, we agonize in prayer. We shall speak later of wrestling against spiritual forces of evil, but it is enough to note that at this point that prayer is not a comfortable hobby, uh, but a strenuous, determined, passionate struggle. When such prayers move heaven, it shakes the earth indeed, as we know from James 5, verse 16. Fervent prayer is effective. The word which is translated fervent, Greek energio, has to do with energy, energetic, or passionate prayers. Romans 12, 11 tells us to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Here the Greek word is zeo, meaning hot, glowing, and earnest. When the Bible quotes prayers, they are often passionate. Moses prayed with profound feeling, even offering his life to save Israel. Many of the Psalms express powerful longings out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord, like Psalm 130, verse 1. Jeremiah's prayers were many, and some such as in chapters 18, verses 19 to 23, and 27 to 18, were heart moving when Ezra prayed, weeping and bowing down before the house of God, as we read in. In Ezra 10 verse 1 he said having torn my garment and my robe I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God and I said oh my God I am ashamed and humiliated to lift my face to you my God Daniel said I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes Daniel 9, verse 3. Rend your heart and not your garments is what Joel chapter 2, verse 13 tells us to do. Jesus himself prayed with vehement cries and tears, as Hebrews 5, verse 7 tells us. He was heard. If there's any technique, tears are part of it. Prayer is not for our night off, but our night on. We are the guards. That is where we stand, having done all. What next? That we shall see in my next message.
This is the number two message in the series on prayer and intercession. What we have to say is important because prayer is the basis of all spirituality. It is necessary, not just nice. Of course, even a lisping child can pray. We should learn all we can about this basic Christian privilege. There is so much to know that would give us confidence before God. We should know something about the conditions, the methods, forms, and purposes of prayer. The Bible uses the phrase, all prayer, suggesting a variety. It is a good work for which the man of God should be thoroughly equipped. I thought I should just mention how Bible people prayed. We pointed out in the first message that the New Testament has 230 allusions to prayer. The Old Testament has many also, but the Hebrew language has no general word for prayer. It uses many expressions for men and women crying out to their God. Because we today have the word prayer, people repeat some empty form or routine, like reciting a poem and call it a prayer. The Lord's Prayer itself can be treated like that. Some of the great prayers recorded in Scripture were spontaneous, straight from the heart. They always prayed aloud and often very noisily. Silent prayer is a comparatively modern custom. They were quite uninhibited in the way they spoke to God. In the Psalms, they often tell God to wake up and ask why he has gone to sleep. Bible people had no special pose for prayer. David prayed an important prayer, and he, as he said, supped before the Lord. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit first fell on the 120 disciples, they were sitting. Bible references generally describe people standing, raising their hands, or kneeling as an act which acknowledges the greatness of God, and one day, of course, every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ. A particular picture is in Ezra, where that worthy character is described as praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God. Nehemiah even wore sackcloth. The strangest prayer was by Jonah in the stomach of a great fish. People have called on God and been heard in the midst of battle or in the sea like Paul or before being executed like Stephen and often when dying. The last words of Jesus were a prayer. We should ask first, what really is prayer? It is eye-opening when we know the answer. We'll answer that, but I would like to start with a scripture which probably puzzles many people. In Genesis 4, verse 26, we read, At that time, man began to call on the name of the Lord. The beginning of prayer. So what happened before that? Had they only just discovered there was a Lord to call upon? Or was it the beginning of religion? I will explain. Until that time, people did not pray. When God made Adam and Eve, the situation was completely different. God was in the garden with them. He was the voice they heard, and they replied to the voice voice. Adam, Eve, and even Cain conversed with God. Those were the circumstances when God made man and walked in the garden. God was close to them. He was always reachable. When we live close to people, we do not pray to one another or petition one another. We only petition those who are distant or even faceless officials such as the government. If we have no real relationship with somebody and we have a request, we put it in a letter and that's all. It isn't conversation. God was in Eden 
daily, always accessible. Then disobedience wrecked that wonderful relationship. God and man became estranged. Adam actually tried to hide from God. It is a pattern repeated all the way through history from that time on. Scripture records that the world was soon filled with violence. There is none that does good. No, not one, says Psalm 14, verse 3. The effect was silence between man and God. No more the voice in the garden. No more conversation. God was distant, that is, when man begun to call on the name of the Lord. Nothing else could be done. We could only pray. Now, when Jesus was on earth, the Son of God, the disciples, did not pray to him. He was there. They talked with him and asked him whatever they wanted. For that short time, what God had been to Adam and Eve, Jesus was to the disciples. But when he left and went to the Father, then they had to call on his name in prayer. That is what prayer is, a special means of communicating in special circumstances. The world lies in the lap of wickedness. It is a dark world unless we walk with Christ in the light. But God has this strategic means to keep in touch. Prayer in the name of Jesus. It is a private line to use for all who believe. Out of the silent planet, the voice of prayer is never silent, linking earth with heaven. However, it is only for the time being. One day we shall see him face to face, and the wonderful relationship enjoyed by Adam in the Garden of Eden will be restored, and more than restored, we shall live and reign with him, the bridegroom will have his bride by his side forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Until that glorious day, we live in an imperfect world, and our relationships and experience are partial and incomplete. Today, the situation, as Scripture says, is he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. No. It is not a perfect means, because this is not a perfect world. Now we see through a glass darkly, but it is a wonderful provision of God while we walk in this fallen world. But when the perfect does come, and it certainly will, prayer will no longer be needed, but will give way to fellowship that today we can only dream about and, of course, long for. Prayer is not a human idea. Whenever we pray, God has put it into us to do so, whether we realize it or not. He comes to us so we can come to him. The Lord said to Ezekiel, Stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. The Lord always takes the initiative. Prayer is much more than just talking to God as if we were on a telephone. What passes between God and us is not just words. Something happens when we pray. In prayer, we breathe the air of heaven. It brings divine oxygen to the bloodstream of faith and energizes workers with God. Something gets us going for God. We collaborate with him, and he collaborates with us. He lights up a root plan in his word, giving us direction and, praise God, destination. The purpose of prayer is not to be lost in God or to get high on God, but as Jesus taught us, your kingdom come. It must have a kingdom focus or it is irrelevant. Prayer brings us into cooperation with him and he with us. 
It is not a refined spiritual ability. We don't take a psychological plunge into a mysterious beyond. Bible people did not meditate to discover God's essence. They were explicit and communicated something which had meaning and executed as much reality in return. For example, in Psalm 102 verse 17 says God will respond to prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Before talking about some of the great principles of prayer, I should mention the actual way people pray. Prayers are always positive communications, but not always petitions and requests. The famous prayer of Hannah in Samuel 1, uh, chapter 2, asks for nothing at all. She only extols the greatness and wonderful works of God. It was worship. Worship is not always the form of prayer, but it can be. Requests can wait. God is to be extolled for what he has already done. Also, Bible religion doesn't lay down specific times for prayer, nor how many times. The Lord allows us the privilege to walk and talk with him at all times and in all places, a picture of the intimacy Adam enjoyed before the fall. Prayer is the absolute basis for all Christian life and activity. Prayer is often treated as just one more Christian job and one that can be crowded out. But it is not one duty among many, but the basis for them all, the platform for all Christian performance, if you wish. We can't substitute prayer by other good deeds. We can do a lot and never pray at all, forgetting that Jesus said, without me, you can do Amen. nothing. Some do so much for God, which should be to their credit, but they can't fit much prayer into their schedule. They are busy here and there while God stands waiting until they have time for him. God's ideal is not that we all work like beasts of burden. Unfortunately, the demand on Christians is generally for more. People are always left with an uneasy conscience uh, that however hard they try, it is never enough. They haven't prayed enough, witnessed enough, attended enough meetings, read the Bible enough, given enough cash, loved enough. If we prayed enough, we might do less, but achieve much, much more. Some talk about being a slave for Christ and think that they should slave for God. It is true, the word for slave, the Greek word is doulos, is used 125 times in the New Testament, but it is better translated as servant. But in New Testament times when people thought of slaves, it was not always that toil and labor oppressed them, but that they did so little. Their lives were tragically wasted. People bought slaves merely for prestige, to show off their wealth, like some buy an expensive motor car today. Slaves waited all day to do some menial task, very occasionally, such as opening a door or pouring wine. People pray, let me burn out for you, dear Lord. Sadly, they do. A burnout is only too common among church leaders. What use is that? Is God pleased to see an, an ash heap? Jesus was no slave driver to the disciples. It seems natural and right to perform everything that is a Christian task, but God isn't asking us to do everything, but only to do his will. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The crucial need is to work with him, not just for him. 
Some wonder how God will manage if they don't buckle in night and day. But God is not desperately short-handed. He can do anything he wants without our aid. His workload is not in any sense lightened by what we do. But there is work he wants us to do just the same. God himself intends to work and his desire is to give us the joy of being with him when he does it, sharing his pleasure. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, is what Isaiah says. These remarks now lay bare the divine strategy. The Lord does not depend upon our Herculean efforts carrying the world on our shoulders, says the Lord of hosts. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Zechariah 4, verse 6. The words might and power here in Hebrew, hayil and koa mean personal exertion and resolution, the resources and stamina of heroes. The kind of power meant by the Hebrew word hayil is not the power of God. His power is different. It is not brute force. God doesn't make efforts. We make efforts. But human power and divine power are totally different in kind. Evil will finally be beaten by weakness, our weakness, and Christ's surrender to his enemy's murderous intentions. The book of Judges tells us about the weak things overthrowing the strong, like Shamgar's ox goad, or Samson with the jawbone of a donkey, or Gideon with clay pitchers, or Jael with a tent peg. God takes us up like Samson's donkey jawbone. He has chosen the weak things to overcome the mighty. We are the weak things by which God intends to cast out the devil and bring in everlasting righteousness. We don't need to try to be humble, for we are not that great anyway. None of us, only the proud try. Human beings often think of themselves as the crown of creation, and in a way we are. Yet, our best Olympic athletes cannot match even ordinary animals. The fastest man is easily outrun by a house cat. Cats, dogs, monkeys, and even sparrows outclass them. God takes no pleasure in the thighs of a man, says Psalm 147, verse 10. Nor will our intelligence ever match the wisdom of the angels. We are baffled by what we see of this marvelous universe. We are mortal, not immortal, fragile flesh, not machines. Yet, he has chosen us. In fact, that is why he has chosen us. It is neither for our physical endurance or intellectual power, but to glorify his name. What we do is only what he does through us. And our finest gift is that one terribly vulnerable factor, faith that works by love. Intercession itself is neither heroic nor brilliant. It is simply love and concern for unknown people, but even that comes from God. He takes away our stony heart and gives us a heart of flesh to feel for others. If love is in our heart, it is because it is shed abroad by the Holy Spirit, as the Word of God declares. God finds hearts and lives through which he can pour his love. Without intercession, our prayers would be lopsided and self-centered. Some actually treat prayer as a way to get away from it all, forget everybody and everything. They shut the door of their prayer room, as Jesus said, but then talk to God about what they want for themselves. Lord, bless me and my wife, my son and his wife, 
us for and no more. But in fact, intercession means remembering everybody and everything. I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. This is good and pleases God our Savior. One advantage of the newscasts is that we can talk to God about the critical situations with which those in authority are faced, praying that God's will shall be done as Jesus taught us. We close the door when we pray, but the effects are open, as Jesus said in the outside world. Intercession makes the most useful people this world possesses. The solitary prayer effects society. We leave the world to love the world, to identify with it and in its troubles. The prophet Ezekiel sat down in a foreign land with prisoners of war to comfort those who had sinned and been carried off. He cared and related to them so caringly that God called him son of man. It has always touched me when I read it, son of man. He was a picture of the Lord Jesus himself who was numbered with the transgressors and called himself the son of man. Now, prayer and practice go together like shoes and walking. It is easier to walk with shoes and with prayer. Kneeling before the Lord puts us on our feet, straightens the path, and removes the obstacles. Then his word to us is, go. The writer of Psalm 18 says, I call to the Lord. And the result is, you, O oh Lord, keep my lamp burning. Israel believed God and the walls of Jericho fell. That was the easy part. But Joshua didn't just go home then in time for a cup of tea. He led his troops who swarmed across the city and took it for God. Hallelujah. Paul spoke of the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and on the left. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, Paul had seen Roman soldiers often enough. They carried a shield in their left hand and a short sword in their right for close combat. In Ephesians 6, verse 16 and 17, he sees the shield as faith and the sword as the word of God. Prayer and faith on our left and combat with our right by the preaching of the word of God. Our safety is not in defense, but in offense. Furthermore, we are not doing all God's will if we don't pray. Prayer is God's will. His wish is not merely for us to do something, but to be something. People who have fellowship with him, which we are not if we never wait upon God. When Joshua took over the leadership of Israel on their way to Canaan, he met a man with a drawn sword, the angel of the Lord. The angel said, as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua was never supposed to be on his own to take possession of the promised land. It simply meant that God had determined Israel would go in and possess the land, and Joshua and the armies of Israel were God's allies. The battle was the Lord's. That wasn't all. Joshua accepted the generalship of this new commanding officer and asked what his orders were. What message has my Lord for his servant? And Joshua had a surprising answer. He expected to be told the strategy of the Lord when and how he should fight. But instead, the command was, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. Joshua 5, 14 to 15. In other words, worship, prayer, our relations with God come before everything. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Psalm 27, verse 1. The text talks about a house. A word concerned with children, a household. For us today, it is the church, the household of faith, for which some work so very, very hard. The builders labor, and the word the psalm chose means toil and difficulty. But without the Lord alongside, all our endurance and effort will be abortive. Church work is pointless unless it produces results. People must be one for Christ. Prayer comes before everything, but that doesn't mean it is everything. If the house is to be built, we must toil. Few things are done by prayer alone. I spoke of those who pray little and work much, but some pray much and work little. There is often a stress upon prayer that suggests that all we have to do is pray and believe and God will do the rest. Joshua was noted for his great faith, but he had to fight. The builders must build. We must go. We must preach the gospel. Spiritual warfare is impossible without the word of God because the word is the sword of the spirit and the word must be used in the way intended by being proclaimed. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 to 10. It is not a magic wand. Waving the Bible at the devil or shouting a text at him will only amuse Satan. It is obedience to the word and preaching the word that worries hell. Petitions and preaching. The same thing appears in Matthew 9, verse 37 to 10, verse 5. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his 12 disciples to him. These 12 Jesus sent out. He made them answer their own prayers. No couch potatoes, just enjoying a good steamy prayer rally with entertaining singers and preacher personalities. If you pray, you also must go. Some pray urgently for the Holy Spirit. They covet the experience, but only want him as such. The Holy Spirit comes not for the thrill. He is given us, but for the throbbing pain of a world in need. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit and power. And then what? He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Multitudes make prayer for revival the greatest aim of their lives with constant prayer, rallies, studies, and conferences. That is a great thing. But if the power that prayer brings is to do any good, contact must be made with the Christless crowds. The gospel itself is the power of God. But if that power is to change lives, it must connect with those lives. It is a two-way thing. First, we bring the gospel to bear upon the world, laying the cables, the power lines, which is the gospel. The gospel is the means through which the power of God flows, and yet it needs something else. Prayer. Prayer presses the switch, and the power of God flows through the message. In our gospel crusades with Christ for All Nations, intercession for multitudes attending is an enormous and pressing urgency. I've had to jump out of bed at 3 o'clock in the mornings to intercede for those to whom I shall later preach. We could say that every successful campaign is the triumph of intercession, the prayers of thousands. The gospel is dynamite, but it is a dormant power. The gospel is cold doctrine, especially in the mouths of some preachers. To release its explosive power, it needs to be detonated. Intercession 
is that detonator. Evangelism without prayer is an explosive without a detonator. And prayer without evangelism is a detonator without anything to explode. In message one, we also refer to the fact that Jesus prayed. The Gospels pinpoints 20 special occasions when he did so, but in fact he prayed much more. In Luke chapter 5 verse 16, um, it says, Jesus often withdrew himself to lonely places and prayed. And he said, learn of me. And the uh, disciples approached him asking, Lord, teach us to pray. They watched and heard him and knew how to pray. Jesus did not say prayers as a formal routine, although there are a dozen different words for prayer. None of them in John's Gospel are used to describe Jesus at prayer. He simply lifted his eyes and said or talked to God. We know Jesus was and is an intercessor, the intercessor, our advocate. For example, Luke 22 verse 32 tells us, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. He prayed before appointing 12 disciples to be with him, probably against the temptation to choose great and gifted men, but rather in line with the principle that God chooses the weak things to confound the mighty and that the Father's will would be done. No world religion has words like Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, or John chapter 17. One Greek word occurs there 19 times, which means so that. In Greek it is the word hina. Jesus prayed so that things would happen. Millions pray five times a day, but for nothing. Merely to repeat a few phrases like a mantra. Tibetan Buddhists repeat endlessly, oh, the jewel in the lotus bud. Yoga gurus uh, repeat even one word, a mantra. And throughout Islam, prayer is a statement that there is one God and his prophet is Muhammad. The Christians, however, pray for salvation, forgiveness, miracles, and the Holy Spirit. But what I want to tell you now is a revelation. God has greater purposes than our personal affairs. We read this in Romans 8, verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that words cannot express. Have we any clue what these mysterious longings may be? I think we have, in the context of this verse, verses 25 back to 19, they speak of the future and the intentions God has for his creation. It reveals that he has plans which stretch far beyond our little day and our little affairs into deep eternity, the everlasting ages. The Holy Spirit certainly yearns for His will to be done, but it goes beyond our work. God's will extends to the ends of space and beyond time into eternity, all heaven and earth. Such greatness and purpose is beyond our comprehension. We do know this his will for ourselves for today and he makes sure we know it i emphasize that he would never leave us to walk day by day in the dark wondering or guessing god keeps his promise to lead us by a sure path without our begging and persuading he does guide he said whether you turn to the right or to the left your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. 
you have made known to me the path of life, says Psalm 16, verse 1. But there is this transcending design of God. His will for each of us is only part of the grand design, the eternal blueprint we could never read or understand. All we know is that he has infinite plans, but not what they are. The Holy Spirit knows as within us he stretches upwards to God. His sigh rises from the depth of our own being. We are one with him and experience a yearning we can't put into words. Something within us wants to change the entire world and the future. We are one with God in our desires for a new world, though we have no words to describe it. But the Holy Spirit does the praying within us as we wait in communion on the Lord. We are predestined to reign with Christ. We are chosen for an eternal role in the economy of God. We have eternal life which links our lives with eternity. We are carried on the flowing river of his immortality. We are moving on into the worlds of tomorrow, all the tomorrow. But God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants. As we read, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We sense eternal things spiritually, though our minds only see them dimly and afar off. This kingdom will come and there will be a new heaven and a new earth in which dwell righteousness. Those are the inward groanings of the Holy Spirit. That is intercession. Drawing near to God is far more potent than we can appreciate. It is a work of God. The people of God are the people of the future, and by prayer, in the Spirit, we are making the future. Our wordless intercession is heard. Jesus taught his disciples a new way to pray. We pray, of course, in his name. He spoke of the power of your name, that the name you gave me in John 17, 11, and the name of Jesus has become the highest title in the universe. Before he came, people prayed to the Lord, but more or less in their own name. Hear me, O Lord, Job comes before God and offers as the grounds that my hands have been free of violence and my prayer is pure, Job 16, verse 17. These old saints came to God with their own virtue as a plea. For example, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Or Psalm 26 verses 4 to 6. Do not sit with the deceitful man, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I wash my hands in innocent and go about your altar, O Lord. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous. Those were the strict terms for prayer, as if God asked, Who are you? Have you the necessary moral credentials? But Jesus opened a new and living way, namely through himself by his blood and covenant, or, as it says, in my name. Amen. The heavenly bank account is not our own deposit of goodness, but Christ's. There is grace sufficient laid up for us all in him. No saint is needed to add one ounce. 
He is all sufficient. Jesus described the new situation. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one. John 17 verse 23. Old Testament saints used many powerful pleas and arguments when they appealed to God. They quoted his past miracles, challenged him to maintain his honor, uh, confessed sins of the entire nation, and even like Moses, offered themselves as the sacrifice to redeem and bring about an answer to their prayers. But we are complete in Christ. His name is gets us the ear of the Almighty. Hallelujah. This means we can be prayer warriors, partners with Christ who prayed in Gethsemane. In Christ, praise is ordained in the mouth of babes and sucklings. In the Old Testament, prayer seemed the reserved privilege of the eminent and the noble kings, prophets, and priests. There were exceptions, such as Hannah, the mother of Samuel, and Jabez, who asked God to extend his borders and keep him from the evil of it. Even they were notable because their prayers happened to relate to the nation. We may not stand with Moses on Sinai, or kneel with Daniel at the heart of an empire, or with Samuel shaking the skies and frightening all Israel with the power of his prayer. But the most ordinary person among us can take the name of Jesus. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry becomes a notable with God, not in their name, but in the name of Jesus. The Father hears them with attention. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. At the beginning of this message, I explained the scripture, then man began to call on the name of the Lord. It indicated that man began to pray, but something more, to call on the name of the Lord. That was the right way. They knew who it was that they addressed. He was not a nameless something, a force, a prime mover. He was the Lord. He had a name, for he was in some sense a person. Actually, he was more than a person. He was beyond personality, but he was still him, somebody with a name. All through the centuries, from the early age, the Lord opened up to his people, showing them more and more progressively what he was. The more we saw of him, the more we were impressed by him. The name of the Lord became wonderful until it became the name of the Lord Christ Jesus. The name we call upon means all that Jesus Christ was. Prayer and intercession hold heaven and earth together. The earth is full of wickedness. It hangs over this globe like a thick pall of obscuring blackness. The atmosphere of earth is polluted by evil, but prayer brings us the freshness of the winds of the Holy Spirit. If we neglect prayer, our spiritual life suffocates. We need to pray to fill our lungs with the breath of heaven. My last word to you in this message is what scripture says, men ought always to pray and not to faint, but faint we will if we do not pray.
of my messages on intercession. In the New Testament, all believers are expected to be intercessors. If we Christians are to match New Testament expectations, then intercession is a crucial subject for us to consider. Think of such texts as James 5 for 16, pray one for another. And then 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 8, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. This is good and pleases God our Savior. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. And then in Ephesians 6.18 we read, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Jesus said that we should even pray for those who spitefully use us in Matthew 5.34. The phrase, without ceasing, occurs six times in the New Testament, and in each case it refers to prayer. That is, prayer for others. Whatever else we stop doing, we must never stop praying for people. Paul wrote, let us not become weary in doing good. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers in Galatians 6, 9 to 10. He wrote twice of this need to keep going to the church in Galatia and to the church in Thessalonica. To the Thessalonians he wrote, never tire of doing what is right. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 and that includes prayer, because he told the same church to pray continually, without ceasing, as the new King James Version translates it. Jesus taught that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart in Luke 18, verse 1. Here is an example of the importance of praying for others. From prison, Paul wrote a very short letter to Philemon about a runaway slave called Onesimus. In it he said, And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Verse 22. Paul believed in their prayers for him, not just in his own prayers, and had real hopes of being released. Why should people have had to pray for Paul to be released when God already wanted him to travel and proclaim the gospel? Was it really necessary? The answer is definitely yes, because prayer is part of God's own plan, his package deal with us. Prayer is not just our natural clamor to God when we are in trouble. Prayer is how he determined that we would communicate with him. More than that, he wishes to bless people, but primarily through others as they pray. If we do not pray, we narrow the channel through which his goodness flows into people's lives. We therefore have a duty to perform that is both a joy and a privilege. That great man of God, Samuel, has impressed me many times. Samuel the prophet and judge of all Israel, for example, was fully aware of his duty to pray for others. For 50 years he prayed for the nation and then he said the following, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. 1 Samuel 12. 23. God's goodness is a constantly flowing river, and prayer directs it into human lives. God has chosen to bless the world through the prayers of his believing, born-again children. You are selected to pray for somebody, so am I. We all are, and usually there are many individuals for whom we are asked to pray. 
The Lord can do what he wants for people when we ask him, especially when he puts one person or another into our mind. When we pray according to his will, we help his will to be done. We could not ask for anything better for anybody than that the perfect will of God should operate in their lives. We use the general term prayer to cover various particular forms of prayer. And in 1 Timothy 2.1, we read about requests, supplications in the King James Version, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving. Let's take a closer look at some of these specific forms of prayer. First of all, intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer basically means praying to the Lord behalf on someone else. It could be simply naming someone in prayer. Paul told the churches in Rome, Ephesus and Thessalonia, for instance, that he always mentioned them in his prayers in Romans 1.9, in Ephesians 1.16, and 1 Thessalonians 1.2. But merely mentioning somebody to God may not seem much, but God does not need to be put into an arm lock every day for everybody on our list. He takes note of what we say without our having to clamor for attention. If we link someone's ordinary human name with the name of Jesus, it is a dynamic union. I'm sure Paul did not merely read a register of names to God every day. Although he mentioned people in his prayers, he clearly did more than that. He told the Philippians, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Philippians 1, 3 to 5. A great heart of concern lay behind his prayers. To the same people he said, I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, 7 to 8. That was true intercession, speaking to the Lord about other people for whom he cared deeply, mirroring the Lord's own heart of love. Then supplication. Despite what I've just said, the word supplication shows us that more than mentioning is called for. The word supplication is a translation of a Greek word Desis, that implies beseeching or pleading, pressing through with our requests. It means a concentrated act of concern and real endeavor to pray through, to put feeling and time into it. Although the original words for supplication in scripture, in Greek, desis, heiketeria, are sometimes simply translated prayer, they are also used for prayers of real heartfelt agony. Of course, supplication does not, does not have to be intercessory. It might be for ourselves. Nowadays, we often use other expressions rather than the word supplication, which has rather an old-fashioned ring to it. We ought to look at them and compare them with the word of God. Sometimes, People talk about prevailing prayer or uh, prevailing in prayer. The idea of prevailing can be found in Exodus <clears throat> chapter 17, verse 11. Amalek attacked the tribes of Israel as they traveled through the valley of Rephidim. While Joshua fought to repulse the enemy, Moses held up his hands to God. When Moses became tired, Two men, Aaron and Hur, kept his hands held high. The biblical account of this incident does not say that anyone spoke prayers, but lifting up hands is a form of prayer. Just like lifting up our heart to God. Nor does it say that Moses prayed prevailing prayers. We read simply that when Moses held up his hand, Israel 
prevailed against Amalek, the attackers. It is important to note one thing. By prayer, Israel prevailed against Amalek. They did not prevail against God. The story gives us an excellent illustration of the need to keep on praying until we prevail over our difficulties, showing us that our battle is not against the Lord. He does not resist our prayers, but rather helps us to pray. The idea that we pray long or hard enough, if we do that, God will give way, is utterly mistaken. Our task is never to assert ourselves in a battle of wills, persisting in our requests until God gives way and grants us what we desire. It is rather to pray for His will to be done, for His will to prevail. So what of wrestling in prayer with God? This comes from Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. At night in the open wilderness, Jacob found a man wrestling with him. At least he took it to be a man until daybreak. And then he was stricken with awe because the man was the Lord who had come to him in that form. Jacob realized that he had seen God and that his life had been spared. Verse 30. If we read this ancient account carefully, we shall note that Jacob was not the one who began wrestling and, in any case, he was not at first aware of who his adversary was. Afterwards, he was amazed that he had not died in such a close encounter with God. The explanation is that God had a vital work to do on Jacob. We might call it spiritual surgery, and Jacob did not find it easy to accept it. Jacob had not followed the Lord as his father and grandfather Isaac and Abraham. God had struggled with Jacob all his life. Now, this struggle became epitomized in a strange physical encounter at night. The struggle of God with Jacob in the darkness is a summary of the whole of Jacob's life to that date. Eventually, Jacob was defeated because the Lord touched Jacob's hip joint and he could not resist anymore. Then comes the curious twist in this rather mysterious story. Jacob began to realize what was happening. He knew that the Lord was wrestling with him to master him. He realized this was the God of Abraham and Isaac, that he meant to become Jacob's God and that Jacob had to give way. He realized that this man, the Lord, was not trying to hurt or kill him, but simply to master him. At that point, Jacob had to stop wrestling, but he still kept a grip on the Lord, saying that he would not let him go unless he blessed him. God had prevailed with Jacob, and now Jacob prevailed with God. God had begun the wrestling match, but he also wanted to fulfill his promise to Abraham that in his family, all families would be blessed. Jacob did not have to rest, to rest God's blessing out of him. God loves to bless. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We should never come to God to wrestle with him as if he was hostile towards us. He is not our opponent ever. His attitude is one of perfect love and reconciliation. That we should treat God as if he had to be overcome is not the lesson of the story about Jacob. In all 66 books of the Bible, it is never once suggested that God is an opponent with whom we must wrestle in order to prevail over his reluctance. God is always for us, forever. Nowhere in the Bible will we find that he needs to be pressurized as if he were unwilling to let us have the good things he has in store for us. 
so many wonderful things. And he does that what we ask him to do. We do not need to defeat him and force him to give them up. The truth is quite different. Basically, if our lives are not in line with the will of God, then God will give us no rest. He will strive with us to bring us back where we should be, not because he wants to punish us, but because he knows that there can never be anything better for us than to be close to his side. Then, when he has won his way with us, we can win our way with God. Glory be to him. When we give way to him, then we can turn to him and say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Genesis 32, verse 26. Jacob said that because he suddenly realized that the Lord, who had a wrestling hold on him, was not a foe, but as a friend trying to help him. God's blessing flowed after Jacob's life was submitted to God's will. At that point in his career, Jacob entered into the great spiritual dynasty of Abraham, of whom God said, I will bless you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, verse 3. In this encounter, Jacob made supplication for himself when he held on to God after being beaten into submission. If we want to pray prayers that prevail with God, we must first let God prevail in our own lives. Until we yield to him, we shall never move the hand that moves the world. God wills only his own will. When our will is brought into line with his will, then his will can be done through us and through our prayers, which become mighty indeed. We often talk loosely about wrestling with God as though he was an unwilling partner. The truth is, we are the unwilling ones, and God may have to wrestle with us. God is willing, but we are sluggish or even reluctant. We wrestle with ourselves, perhaps even when it comes to prayer. We are up against the devil who will do his best to distract us or fill our minds with the idea that prayer is useless. We must prevail over all such suggestions and hold on to God who wants to bless us and bless others through us. The word wrestle is used once, just once in the New Testament in that much used verse, Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The Greek word for wrestle is found only this once in the New Testament, where our conflict is clearly with spiritual forces. However, nothing is said here about praying against spirits. No mention is made of demons or of spiritual powers to oppose them. We are, not to, we are not instructed to address them in prayer, to engage in direct hand to hand combat. When we expel unclean spirits from their victims, we do not pray to them to go, but pray to the Lord for his word of authority. Our preaching the gospel is our means of attack against all the forces of the devil which assume a thousand forms, not just possession and physical manifestation. The major areas of conflict are the will of people and unbelief. Now to the word travail. The word travail is used by Paul speaking of his physical labors in the interests of preaching and teaching. He says that he and his companions wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable 
to any of you. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 8. In his first letter to the same church, he wrote in a similar vein. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone. First Thessalonians 2, 9. Such was the depth of his concern for the Galatians that he expressed it with another word in Galatians 4, verse 19. That is translated travail in the King James Version or in the pains of childbirth in the NIV. That allows us a glance beneath the surface of Paul's life. He prayed in travail like a woman giving birth to a child. How many pray like that? Some have to have some sort of program just to fill in one hour of prayer. But Paul envisaged no such problem for any of us. There is so much and there are so many for whom prayer is a lifeline. Now, that travail was no wrestling with God, but was surely seen by the Lord as part of the great selfless dedication of Paul. From his letters, it is obvious that he prayed often and ardently. He also remembered so many people by name, some of absolutely no special importance, and they have been immortalized by being mentioned in the Bible. What a lovely man the Apostle Paul must have been. Behind the Apostle's prayers lay his life of commitment and love. Faith works when we love. Passion and prayer go together, not an ersatz passion, stirred up in a fervent meeting, but the genuine article that is seen in night and day physical effort, the kind Paul described in 1 Corinthians 13 with the words, love never fails. Wherever Paul was, in prison, or in any kind of hardship, he was sold out to his calling, single-mindedly setting out to win the nations for Christ. We said earlier that intercession is prayer for others, but we do, of course, ask for things for ourselves. Jesus gave us personal prayers. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debt that sins. Do not lead us into temptation. Matthew 6, 11, 13, Luke 11, 3 to 4. Now here is an apostle. What was his personal request? What was his greatest desire? He told the church in Philippi what it was. Philippians 3, 7 to 14 gives us the key word and it is, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That is a profound statement. It is the secret of the heart and mind of an apostle with a very great heart and a very great mind. We have to read it in depth, not superficially, as we look at it more closely let me tell you how I understand it. Notice what Paul did not ask or mean. He did not ask for a, a visual or photographic view of God, nor to be able to understand unknown mysteries about the being of God, who is, in any case, too great for our small minds to survey. Paul did not ask for anything like that at all. He already knew God anyway. Paul's desire was different. It was for the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Christ's death and resurrection, he wanted to share the experience of Christ, although he knew he could never experience it beyond a certain degree. Paul could not have drunk the same cup that Christ drank. The world's redeemer, had taken to his lips the greatest chalice of sin and death, filled with the world's toxic evils. We shall never know the dark depths 
of the night through which the Lord passed. But Paul wanted to get so close to God that some glimmer of understanding of those sufferings penetrates his consciousness. What a petition! What a prayer! There are deeper levels of human nature than what we see. We can know our friends well in one way, but we don't react with their reactions. They have fears, hopes, and sensations. We know nothing even though we have lived in their home and know their abilities and disposition. That is how we should know God. Paul is asking to know Christ at that deeper level. He was not interested in gleaning certain facts about him, but in sharing the divine experience. As we read the word, we see the greatest aspect of the experience of Jesus. Christ's whole life, pattern and passion, was to do the will of God, which meant one thing above all else. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we are to know God, we must share the same great passion for sinful people to be saved. It is as Paul wrote to Philemon, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Verse 6, evangelism brings an understanding of God's heart. If we have no such interest, then we know God very superficially. To know God is to know his heart and mind as he sends his son to save the world. It is to know the son as he walks the road to Calvary. To know God is to know him to the extent that we share his great evangelistic desire ourselves. We know God only as far as we are like God, loving the souls of men and women. Those like Christ know Christ. His whole life was an enacted prayer, and that prayer was for the lost to be found, the blind to see, and the vile to be clean. Now, let me say something about waiting on God. Here is a very startling fact which anybody can verify, but few seem to notice. Scripture often speaks about waiting upon the Lord, but it never talks about waiting upon the Lord in prayer. Nobody in the Old or the New Testament did that. The practice of kneeling in silence, waiting for the Lord to speak words of heavenly guidance, to give prompting or impressions, is not learned from the Bible. The saints of the old did not specifically spend time with their minds open to voices or leadings. The truth of God did not come through dreams and subjective experiences as in Islam, Buddhism, Mormonism and a thousand other religions. This process of mysticism is not featured anywhere in the Bible. The early apostolic church did not practice waiting upon the Lord in mystical anticipation. Even the Old Testament prophets did not leave their minds open for subjective impressions, but God spoke to them as and when he wanted. In Acts 13, the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch heard from the Holy Spirit that Paul and Barnabas were to be sent on a missionary journey, but they did not receive these instructions while they waited in prayer, but rather as they ministered to the Lord. Acts 13 verse 2. They were guided in the will of God, but not after seeking for guidance. They took it that God was guiding. However, that is not all that can be said on this matter. One well-known text often quoted is Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Scholars show that the Hebrew words translated wait should be understood as hope, that is, 
hope in God, which is how the verse is translated in the NIV. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. It is hope in the Lord that brings strength and renewal. In the New Testament, Paul used similar language. He commended the Thessalonians for their patience of hope, or as the NIV renders it, your endurance inspired by hope. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Waiting on God means waiting in hope of divine help. Isaiah was addressing the nation of Israel in the midst of terrible danger when fear turned their hearts to water and their knees were knocking. His message to Israel was that they should put their entire confidence in the Lord and that would bring them renewal of national strength. They would soar on wings like eagles. In modern terms, there would be no holding them down. However, waiting upon the Lord will always be a common expression among Christians. We can call our times of prayer waiting upon the Lord, providing it does not misdirect us into unscriptural quietism. Prayer is not a mystical exercise in listening for voices from beyond. God takes the initiative when he speaks. He does not perform to our bidding. Drawing aside to wait silently for God to speak gives the enemy a chance to put false ideas and impulses into people's minds. This has led to serious errors and false teachings. We are warned about random voices. John warns Christians that not every spirit that speaks is from God. 1 John 4, 1 to 3. And Jesus himself spoke of the possibility of the very elect being deceived in Matthew 24, 24. God does speak, but not necessarily in our prayer time. Normally he speaks by his word. Prayer is not a dialogue or a conversation. We speak to God in prayer. He may speak to us at any time. And we can use the word as we pray. Many of the Psalms can be prayed. Waiting upon the Lord is not limited to half an hour spent on our knees, but all the time. Hope is not an empty struggle. We have a living hope and wait through life for that hope to be realized, namely the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should live like men that wait for their master, as Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 36. If we only wait upon the Lord in prayer, that is a poor kind of spirituality. If we are only open to God's voice when we make time for it, then we are failing to wait upon the Lord. For Christian waiting means being constantly ready to be led of the Lord. Nonetheless, if our hope is to be strong, prayer is essential. Prayer means putting ourselves on the path to walk with God where God can speak to us. It is the path of his will made known to us in the word of God. God is just as near to us after we have prayed as when we are praying. Our heart should be open to him at all times. That kind of life stance is essentially one of obedience. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears, as we read in 1 Samuel 3, 9 to 10. Now I come to the intercession of Jesus Christ himself. In chapter 17 of John's Gospel, that is the holiest of holy in the Bible. It is the intimate prayer and intercession of Jesus as he approached the hour of his atoning death. Every line is rich in truth, far beyond anything this message can convey. Jesus interceded on behalf of his disciples and also, as he says, for those who will believe in me 
through their message. John 17, verse 20. That means every believer throughout time, wherever they may be, which includes you and me. In fact, he asks that the world may believe. John 17, 21. Here is a real lesson in intercession. Christ does not ask God simply to bless us. He puts into words his deepest concern and desires for us. His prayer is not a rambling expression of good wishes. Listen to this amazing category of his thoughts for us. Protect them, verse 11, that they may be one, the same verse, that they may have the full measure of my joy, verse 13. Protect them from the evil one, verse 15. Sanctify them by the truth that they may be truly sanctified, verse 19. That all of them may be in me, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, verse 21. May they be brought to complete unity, verse 23. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, verse 24. That the love you have for me may be in them, verse 26. But behind all these requests are some of Christ's great revelations. Possibly the underlying thought of this great prayer is that Christians should be united with the Father and with one another. It is that unity which makes intercession possible. When their unity has broken down, it is as if the lines of communication are down. First, Jesus spoke to God, his Father, about his own unity with him. Father, you are in me and I am in you, verse 21. The perfect oneness of Jesus with the Father was the secret of his prevailing prayers. He prayed in the Father and the Father prayed in him. Then Jesus prayed, may they also be in us. More than that, he said, that they may be one as we are one. The Greek word for us, katos, that is used here means in the same manner. Just as the Son is one with the Father, he asked that we would be one also with the Father and the Son. But the Son spoke about believers collectively, not as individuals. We are one together in Christ. In practical terms, this means that when we are in spirit, one with another, with no divisions of heart and spirit, we are one in God. Then our prayers can become like those of Jesus. He prayed because he was already close to God, not in order to get close, as we said in a previous message. Because he was close, he was heard. God hears those who walk close to him and are in him, heart and soul. They harbor no ill will towards others, but cherish a brotherly spirit in their heart. If we are at loggerheads with other believers, have an isolationist attitude, or feel we are right and they are wrong, if we consider ourselves to be one of the elite or suppose we are special spiritual persons above ordinary Christians, then we are not one with anybody. How can we intercede for others if we are against them? We are never told to pray against other people, but unfortunately, some people do. Two ladies once wrote to the famous preacher, Dr. Joseph Parker, in London, Dear Dr. Parker, we are praying for your death. We have been very successful in two previous cases. That is not Christian prayer. Prayer is feeling what other people feel and sharing it with God. 
It is weeping with weeping people before the Lord. If we have antagonistic feelings towards anybody, it isolates us. God cannot share that with us. Feelings of that kind are completely foreign to him. God has no commerce with those who are full of hatred or even dislike. Loving and interceding for our enemies exhibits the supreme power of love and astonishes the very angels, principalities and powers in heavenly places. Nothing can outmaneuver love. Not even the devil himself is smart enough for that. He cannot get past any man or woman on their knees pleading before God for others. In fact, the devil is allergic to that kind of praying. The model is Christ's intercessory prayer in John 17, which got all hell in a fury. And now I want to share with you what we can do to help answer our own intercession. In these three messages, we have talked and referred to Luke 10, 2 to 3. First comes the instruction to pray. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Then, in the same breath, Jesus says, Go, I am sending you out. The people who pray for things to happen should also be prepared to act so that they can happen. Workers are the people to pray for workers. I wonder what God thinks about us praying neatly formulated prayers, presenting all the right requests, and then just expecting him to get busy while we relax and watch television. What about watching with Christ? Jesus means business. He digs people out of their snug little burrows, overturns their cozy nests and says, follow me. Then off he strides where heroes dare not go, doing work no macho man would dare to tackle. And he makes no apology for the kind of service he leads us into. I think anyone reading the Bible for the first time would notice how often the word send occurs over 1,000 times, in fact. It is a book about sendings. A stranger to the Bible might wonder whatever is going on when so many people are being sent out. Before commenting further, first let me point out one or two things of importance. There are two Greek words that are usually translated as send. For those interested, these are pembo and apostello. They are used about 200 times in the New Testament, 60 of which are found in John's Gospel alone. But when Jesus said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in Luke 10 verse 2, he used a different word and one that is quite surprising. Here the word is exballo, meaning to eject to expel, cast out. It is used of Jesus expelling unclean spirits, for example. Actually, an exact English equivalent cannot be found for expallo. But we might catch the spirit of what Jesus was saying if we translated the sentence something like this. Lord, Throw more troops at the enemy, more workers into the harvest field, or pitchfork workers into the job. Some people need that kind of treatment to get them going. Intercession can bring about a new spirit of energy and zest into lukewarm Christian lives and revive things that are dying as he commissions people to go. I think Jesus is saying, throw yourselves into this work. Hallelujah. One of the ordinary words for send is important too. 
Apostello occurs six times in Christ's intercessory prayer in John 17. For example, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Verse 18. The word apostello, which is used here, gives us the word apostle, one who is sent. This word sent, echoing and resounding through scripture, reveals a cardinal principle of biblical revelation. God does not usually come. He sends. He involves human beings in what he wants to do, just as he put man on earth to till the soil. So he uses men and women for his great program of salvation and healing. And his son became man because it is through mankind that God will conquer the devil and all evil. Part of God's program is the work of intercession, which is a crucial feature in God's scenario. In Isaiah's famous vision, God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah 6 verse 8. Isaiah was sent when he said he would go. In John's Gospel, Jesus said 41 times that he was sent by the Father. It is the sense of being sent by God that is so important if we are to display any authority as we present the Word of God. One last point as I come to the end of these three messages on intercession. Although the Father sent the Son, and the Son could truly say, whatever the Father does, the Son also does. In John 5 verse 19, there was one thing He did and still does that the Father did not do, pray. However faithfully we devote ourselves to God, intercession remains a necessity. The world must be prayed for. It is part of the job. It is as much the work of God for us as it was for Christ in His work. The work and the will of God can only be carried out by intercessors, people who work but never intercede, do not so much walk along with God as limp along with God. Let's be determined to walk with the steps that are sure. We have heard the word of God with regard to intercession, which is an integral part of our ministry to reach the lost and dying. Those two things belong together. We walk on our knees in order to arrive on our feet to bring in a mighty harvest for God. Until today, this has been a highly successful recipe and we will continue with it because it is a thorough and proper reflection of the word and of the will of God. So, having heard so much about intercession, prayer and supplication let's join our hearts and hands and pray for the harvest of the lost and the whole world as much as for our dear brothers and sisters scattered across the world who are blessed by these messages let us pray together hallelujah hallelujah we worship you lord we praise you we praise you we praise you Lord, we thank you that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that we are one in you as you are one with the Father. So we are one with you and one with another. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you that the strongholds of Satan are falling. We thank you, Lord, that the walls come crumbling down. But we also thank you that your kingdom is coming with power and glory. I bless my brothers and sisters who have just heard this Bible study. I pray that by the Holy Spirit it may be anchored in their hearts, that they may go out, rise in Jesus Christ, 
and preach the gospel. Be effective witnesses for you. Healing the sick in the name of Jesus. Destroying the works of the devil. We thank you, we praise you, and we worship you in Jesus' wonderful name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I trust that you have enjoyed this teaching on intercession as much as I have enjoyed giving it to my team. I also pray that the Lord may have given you some new insight and some benefit for your own spiritual work. I pray that we may continue to pray and intercede, but at the same time be thrust into the ripe harvest fields of God. This is the purpose of God and of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that this message may have had an impact on you along this line. God bless you.